Hello and welcome to episode 124 of the Greenway Outdoors podcast. My name is Kyle. I'm AJ. I'm Jeff. I'm Ryan. And we are jo- joined by Logan. Now, Logan is with Quiet Cat, which if you've seen our episodes, if you've seen our show, if you've seen our social media, and uh, pretty soon our vlog as well, you know we're big Quiet Cat supporters and that's what we use. And we've been working with Quiet Cat now for a couple years. And the one thing that sets apart Quiet Cat to us was always the the quality of the product itself. Something you yeah. always say too, it's like the materials that are used, because <laughs> yeah. you guys are telling us, Logan, that you guys are gonna be coming out with new Quiet Cats. And uh, we got off the call with you and AJ goes, well, what are they gonna do to it? <laughs> like, what, is it, like what, <laughs> what What? else do you want? Um, it's kind of, it's cool too, because when people are asking me, because they're like, oh, you have one of those electric bikes. And typically people <laughs> ask like, every what time. What does that run? You know, it's the conversation that you get every time is like how much they cost. And there is cheaper options, but there's also, you know, Chevy Malibus and there's Ferraris. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> yeah. and You're walking around with a, a Rolex and people are like, oh, nice watch. Right, yeah, right, 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 right. Exactly. And, um, but the materials of Quiet Cat are superb. We've had nothing but good luck. Um, and as you guys know, we don't partner with any company that we don't feel comfortable with. Um, so, Logan, what do you do at Quiet Cat? Yeah, great question. Uh, I started out on the sales side. Um, it was my first foray into sales in the outdoor industry. And now I've kind of switched over to heading up the marketing team. My, my whole previous career was in, in marketing in the outdoor space. So um, that's kind of where I'm at now. Yeah. Um, so marketing is like dealing with people like us, like different sponsorships yeah. and things like that. It's, it's a broad, broad word, right? It goes everything from ambassadors and content and PR and media to brand strategy and even product design, right? Um, do a lot of product development work with feedback we get from the pros we work with and from our consumers. Honestly, some of the best product ideas that I've come across in my, my history of working with different outdoor brands has always come directly from the consumer. And the brands that listen to their consumers, I think it shows in their product. Speaking of consumer stuff, not to make this about me because it's a little bit about you too. Uh, the um, when you look at the recent promotion that you guys have been doing, this really pumped me up. And I saw and heard that it was you who put this together. It was a bunch of ice fishing stuff. And I will tell you what I love. Ice fishing is one of my favorite things to do. Traveling around, doing ice fishing um, derbies, participating in events getting out away into the mountains away from everyone we've done it all and in michigan it's always been like a thing and we were talking about the fact that like growing up we always went new year's day my dad and i but we haven't been able to go on new year's day in like years now Mm -hmm. like it's been like 10 years since you could actually pull that off and um global warming you guys yeah that's what it is you guys were uh you guys were posting pictures using ice tires pulling shanties like it wasn't a big deal. And that's the one thing that sucks about ice fishing in Michigan is a lot of the best ice fishing, lake trout, walleye, you're talking about going four or five miles out, it's a drag, you know what I mean? It's terrible. But you were pulling them out on ice tires, so please tell me about that change because that's <laughs> that's what I care about personally. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess I'll start with the idea behind there, there's a lot of different use cases for e-bikes. I think people get caught up in the idea of using it for hunting, and it's a great hunting tool, don't get me wrong. Do you think um, that you was like the marketing episode. in the beginning? Like the marketing was always positioned around that? <clears throat> it was, and that's kind of where the idea came from. The two founders of Quiet Cat, Jake and Justin, they own uh, a, a big property in the Golden Triangle of Illinois, right? And they were doing outfitting, and they realized, wow, we can hunt our set property size way more frequently with less a- land impact because of the silentness and scentlessness of the bikes, right? So that's that's where the idea of Quiet Cat came along. And the and ultimate Cat bear hunting truly, machine too. Was, yeah, they were they truly were the the pioneer of of e bikes, right? It's um it was ten years ago that the first ever fat tire e bike was a Quiet Cat, and then it's kind of evolved from there. But it, it definitely did start in in the whitetail woods, and now actually we have a funny stat from our listening to our consumers, right? Ninety percent of people buy a Quiet Cat for hunting. But 90% of the time they use it, they're actually using it for <laughs> anything you can imagine, getting groceries, going on a beer run, pulling their kids down to the park in a burly, pulling their kids in sleds in the front yard behind the quiet cat. I mean, you name it. Um, we and, are that statistic. And that's of, yeah. <laughs> we are the statistic. Yeah. And that's one of my goals, right, is to tell this more of the stories about how we use these products, right, personally. And just like you said, personally, you love ice fish. I grew up in northern Wisconsin. 
Um, that's kind of how I paid for college. I guided for ice fishing in the winter and I guided musky fishing in the summer. And then, you know, I trap a little bit in the winter and that's how I paid for school. And, you know, first thing I thought of when I saw an e-bike is early ice because you can't use a snow machine. You can't use a four-wheel ice isn't thick enough yet. And that's when the best fishing is. And so you want to be out there hole hopping. You want to be out there ice trolling. And so, yeah, throw studded tires on those bad boys, put some bar mitts on there so your hands stay nice and toasty and go pop a hundred holes in a day and just go stay on the fish. And so we just did a quiet cat short film on that. And I think it's going to turn out pretty good. We iced three monster uh, high country ice trout and uh, it was, it was really good. I can't wait to, yeah, I'm pumped to see that. That's the thing is what I always imagine too, is a lot of the lakes Jeff and I would go to, there was always like a couple really good spots and then one okay spot. So we normally just have to set up in one of the really good ones. Flag goes off. You know, you could set it maybe 20 yards away from you. That might be pushing it as far as like getting to it in time, uh, especially with what we were targeting. But now, as long as you can see it, you mm-hmm. can do it. You know what I'm saying? And you could put that one down the ice aways, have the bike like in the middle, hop on it, go down. It's That's everything. Yeah, that's everything. Because it really opens up having that – couple tip ups in that one hole that otherwise wouldn't be able to. Mm. The other thing is one of the favorite things we do is we like to go like we'll get Airbnbs and stuff on lakes where it's like on the water. So you'll set up tip ups while you're inside. So you park that bike right on the back porch and just be set to go, you know, pop on your boots and be out there in two Mm -hmm. seconds. Yeah. It's just, you can get there so much faster and it's cool. Those uh, the studded tires will also help because I would say every trip we go on, at least one of us falls once when we're like flag, 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 and we got to get there, someone falls. Well, if you can just get on your e-bike, and <laughs> you know. How, what did the study tires it, run? It worked way better than I thought it would too. Like I, I did a little bit of motocross racing and stuff as a kid, and we'd always throw studded tires on the dirt bikes. But sure. the studded tires on the dirt bikes are like full-on screws, right? And it's like, uh, and the e-bike, it's like their 45 North is the company who makes the ones that we sell. Okay. They run right, about 300 bucks to answer your question. Um, and those studs are, uh, either carbide or tungsten and oh, wow. they worked so incredibly, um, to your point, like you, this ice was so glare the other, and this was actually, wasn't part of what we were filming. I went out on a personal ice fishing trip for uh perch the next weekend. That boy. The ice was so glare. It was like the slippery glare, like where it's really hard to stand on. Yeah. And you get on that bike and you were just actually, I had a blast. I was drifting just everywhere. That's awesome. Dude. That sounds Riding fun. around. So. Um, yeah, to your point, you, you know, you can use the e-bikes just within ice fishing for a lot of purposes, right? We were using them to pull actually two full ice sleds with a person sitting on it. We were pulling across the ice, no problem. Stop. So it's a good gear hauler. It's great for just little like remote quick hit. You put like a one person clam behind you and just go pole hop and sure. ice troll. It's great for when you're trying, like you have Navionics or I use a thing called C-Map. It's what Loran's social maps do. And so you can go look at your underwater topography, but you want to confirm what you're seeing on your map is what you're on. So you cover a lot of ground to punch holes to make sure, sure you're on that hump before you set up your shack. It's good for that. Another thing, you mentioned chasing flags. A big thing we do in Wisconsin is we fish walleyes at night in shallow bays. And so you can throw a tip-up light you can see from a half mile away. Yeah, it's like right? Rudolph's nose, I always you- say. <laughs> Bing, bang, boom, man. Well, you get real excited when you see Rudolph's nose pop up out there, but you got to get there quick because those walleyes will grab that bait and they might let it go. They're really finicky eaters. It's not like a pike, right? Right. And so you see that red that red Rudolph's nose pop up and to fly over there real quick and be able to catch that fish, is a, it's kind of a game changer. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm just pumped to do it. We've started a vlog series to go into addition with our main TV show itself. And the idea behind it was to interact with our audience – all year round instead of just our history channel show and just our podcast like along for the ride on our adventures and as we're developing it i was like i want to do ice fishing overnights you know like (laughs) get the cots get the stuff and i'm like man that's gonna be a haul to pull everything out then i'm talking to you and you're talking about the tires and i'm like yes now we got it that's (laughs) something we can actually pull off but um i'm I'm pumped about it i'm pumped about that and the different uses that you can use it for we did a, a pheasant hunt and we actually produced a video Uh, We got to finish the talking part in front of it, but we produced the video where it's like we're going out and pheasant hunting and we're explaining how we were doing it. Basically in the show, and this is in the History Channel show, you've got strips of corn or strips of cover and, you know, you're walking through it. You've got a couple blockers down at the end. 
So the problem is if you drive the truck down to the end, which is normally like what? 500 to 1,000 yards down, yeah. sometimes even farther. Yeah. It's a long ways. If you're going to go all the way to the end and set up the blockers, but you drive down there or you walk and you're loud because you're slow, it'll stir up the pheasants and a lot of times they'll kick out of there and then they won't be there when you're there. With the quiet cat, you're quick enough, but you're quiet enough, hence the name, that you're not <laughs> you're not blowing it all out. You can get down there quick, quiet, not mess everything up. Everyone can walk down to you. And then you can do it again and keep staying ahead of the group, which we thought was pretty effective. Yeah. Yeah. It was nice not having to walk that far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, in the white tail world, people use them similar. And the more we talk about e-bike usage, people actually always get like offended or angry because what they do is they're using it for the same thing and they think it's their little secret. Right. And oh, then you really? go on a public forum and, and talk about it and they're like, oh, dang, why would you say that publicly? Like, right. We were, that was our secret. Right. But one, one of the things that the whitetail hunters have been doing is, you know, you talk about uh, accessing tree stands and a scent cone blows, obviously, from narrow close to you and your scent spreads as it goes further away from you. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, you 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 might have to get past a bedding area to get to a good tree stand. So the easiest way to describe this without using my hands to show you so that the people who are listening can see it is if you're accessing a tree stand that's on the north side of a bedding area. Right. That if you're coming in from the south, heading north, <clears throat> off to your left hand side, which would be your west, would be the bedding area, and the wind is blowing from east to west, you have to pass through that scent cone to hunt the stand where the wind is not blowing to the air, but you have to pass through the scent cone to access that stand. Mm -hmm. To walk through that stand takes you 10 minutes to walk through, and you're stinky and you're smelly because you're sweating and you're walking. Jeff, yeah. Or you no, can pass do through in two and a half <laughs> seconds. You can pass through in two and a half seconds on an e-bike, right? Just completely silently and scentlessly. You that that deer kind of goes like, oh, and then just lays back down, right? No big deal. Versus if you walked through it, your scent spread to the bedding area, it blew it out. You'll never see those deer. So very similar to what you're saying of you know hunting it for upland. You just have easier, quieter access. One of the things I think is missed too uh, with quiet cats specifically is, you know, the thing where you're driving and you pass deer. And you stop the truck and they don't care, but you open the door and they freak out. Mm -hmm. It's like something happens. The e-bike, the way it works is like when you're blowing by, they they don't get – it's like you're in the car. Like the, the, yeah, the reaction that I see from animals is that you're in the car. Right. That's, that's what I continually see from deer, bear, everything. So I don't know how to describe what I'm trying to say any better than that, but there's something too when you're in a car – you pull up on deer, they'll sit there and stare at you. You open the door, they freak out. It's like they're gone. I've got a, I've got a word for you. Uh, they've done studies on it. It's, it's called, called quiet bipedal. catism. <laughs> <laughs> it's called, it's actually called bipedal cadence. So, like, if you're walking, you as a human have a bipedal cadence. It's not something they naturally hear in the woods. Step, step, step. They're used to four-legged creatures, right? Mm. So that bipedal cadence throws them off. Whereas a wheel, right, on a bike or a vehicle. It doesn't, it just, they aren't as affected by it because they don't That's associate it with, hmm. right, a problem or a danger. Sounds like you've been like going down Michigan's highways. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, did Sorry. you guys do any sort of like, uh, when you were taking the bikes out on the ice, did you do any sort of like, uh, like weight pull test? I know you said you brought a few sleds out, but did you try to max it out and just try to see how much weight it could get across the ice? I mean, we're always product testing in everything we do. Like I have, and I will talk a little bit about the stuff we have coming in 24 later, but part of that ice fishing trip was testing the new 24 bikes. And we didn't like quantify it. What I can tell you is I didn't have enough gear with me and I could not find enough rocks that were loose on the bank to stop the bike from going in. <laughs> All right. Because what, ha what happens on the ice is that ice and snow, like a sled on snow has so little friction. Right. Right. And, and the weight is not on the bike itself. So there's no like max load worry on the bike. It's only what the bike can pull. Mm -hmm. And when it studs to ice, pulling something as little friction as two sleds and a couple of humans hanging on a sled, it was like easy, like easy, easy. The butter. That's yeah. Nuts so it's a lot that. like pulling our trailers, right? Like that wheel has such a big advantage from from pulling. Uh, <laughs> now, what would, be, what would be fun is like to do like a truck pull test, right? Where you have like a weight like a 45 pound um like dumbbell or you know 45 pound plate from a gym and just drag it across the ground <laughs> and to see it would be fun to see like what it could pull well yeah. it's like with the vlog i'm thinking now it'd be fun to like he's get, hijacking my vlog 
get <laughs> get some ice skates on and and tow someone around and start just ripping around a lake. That'd be pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did AJ it yesterday. Skates? We did a <laughs> yeah, we did a fun winter photo shoot at work. Just like hey, again, how do people use these bikes that is not hunting related, right? And so we did a family photo shoot day where we were pulling kids on the sleds, we were pulling people on ice skates, we were just drifting around on the ice, just out there hooting and hollering and having it. That's awesome. Yeah, pulling people on skates, if I had to like, and this isn't an exaggeration with our new 24 bikes, if you had studded tires and you were on glare ice, you could probably pull like 100 people that were on ice skates because there's no friction. <laughs> zero. So you could, you could just pull... Well, we'll see. You're really. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it was 97. <laughs> I, I will say, when we have people out to the office, one of the biggest draw, like things that people are excited about, it's like, all right, well, we're going to go get food. Like, okay, like, do we hop in the truck? Like, nah, nah. We're going to get on we some don't quiet cats mm. and go get some food, and they have the time of their lives. Tell them the truth. It's ice cream. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, it, is. Okay. it really is ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. It is ice cream. Everyone comes here. We got two good ice cream joints in town. So, like, when people come visit us, they're like, oh, let's go to either Dairyland or the Scoop. They're both closed right now, though, for the winter. So, womp, womp. yeah. Uncle hey, is it, opens on is it ice cream day. or is it custard? You got to be careful, you know. Yeah, it's ice cream. <laughs> we go and get custard yeah. from Culver's. Yeah. Ryan, yeah. Ryan likes. I love Ryan Culver's. Ryan loves Culver's. <laughs> Do you, you're from yeah. Wisconsin. You have Culver's. I think yeah, yes, sir. I, know, I actually know the I know the Culver's family uh, personally. I well, he's him. I did a case study. With oh him. my he's, god, he's keeping him in business. He's keeping him in business. Good. You do? <laughs> like it's, it's Santa it's Claus. Hard to, it's hard to beat a butter burger, man. It, oh, that's Culver's funny. Blood. You can't beat a butter burger. They're the best. That's as great. far as fast food goes, they also have chicken tenders pretty pretty zeroed in too. Yeah, yeah. yeah they they're get, not they're not doing anything wrong. They got the yeah. shelf. <laughs> they're Thanksgiving out. style sides. Oh, now I want. Now I want. Colors. I love them. <laughs> I, look you at hear me? me? Look he at doesn't me. get this love. excited about anything. Um, <laughs> and there's our first uh, little little tunnel we went down. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Let's get um, back No, I I hey, like before before that tunnel we were uh, talking upland stuff. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned the corn the corn rows. I mean that's a great example. Of one way that I I do that I, I end up hunting alone a lot, just me and my dog, right? And I'll do the same thing that you guys did, but I'll bring my truck. I'll leave my truck on one end and I'll leave an e-bike on the other end. And then I'll walk with my dog, Yep. you know, however long it is, if it's a strip of timber or a strip of corn, a mile, two miles, three miles, however long it is. And then I end at the bike, yep. right? And then I can ride back to the truck instead of having to walk. So in our History Channel show, that's exactly what we did. Um, we actually went to, we were trout fishing. And to me... When we got the Quiet Cats, all I cared about was trout fishing. I was like, that is what it's for. Like, what people were like about whitetail, I'm like, yeah, it's cool for whitetail, but it's this is a trout fishing thing. Because <laughs> you, when you're fishing the rivers, it's the same thing every time. Is What I'll do is you get to a spot where getting out wouldn't be a big deal. But, man, getting in will be a nightmare, and the walk would be insane. So – I would literally drop the truck off downriver because I walk downriver because of the way we fish. I know people hate that, but that's what we do. And I drop the truck off. I jump. I get the bike out. I'll go a mile upstream, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it takes a long time to fish a mile. Mm -hmm. We learned that the first time. At our pace. (laughs) Yeah. Because if there's a fish in a hole, I have to cast until he dies or Mm -hmm. I do. Um, But um, (laughs) we were going like – I remember the first time we were going trout fishing, like where we're like, this is what we're doing now that we figured out how to do it when we were kids. Mm-hmm. So like we pinned off like three miles. And we're like, okay, because I run a 5K, if it takes 20 minutes. So that Walk take a mile it. in 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we got out there and it was like, we're not going to make it in before dark. <laughs> and it was we like, made it like a quarter, like a half mile maybe. We were so thirsty. Uh, <laughs> um, Jeff drank warm lemonade or I've something when we got I've never hated <laughs> mosquitoes more. <laughs> yeah, that is one thing about trout fishing. Mosquitoes suck. But anyhow, so you drop the truck off downriver at the spot where you want to get out, and you take the bike up through the woods, and you can drive it through some crap. Like there, There's a hunt cast video on our YouTube channel where we went trout fishing with the e-bikes, and – we're driving like over like logs and hills and like garbage, like borderline dirt bike in it with it. And it was fine. And then to get all the way back, then you hide the bike off the trail. If you're Ryan, you spend a half hour blending it in and everything else too. <laughs> you but can, the camel ones, <laughs> you can put them in the grass and the ferns. And then I go grab other ferns and stick them in the spokes. It, <laughs> it's a good idea. But the guy was like, he's like, 
wrapping up 20 minutes and hiding this bike well, the that has a lock on it. <laughs> the problem was once we got back, I'm like looking for it. Yeah, you can't yeah. find it. It's his own worst enemy. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that is actually pretty funny. But yeah, then you get down to the truck, then you drive back up as close to the bikes as you can, and then you just go grab the bike and pull it back up, and you're good to go. But yeah, that is pretty funny. It's like, yeah, that's... It was what, when it was raining. Oh, it's I got pouring. back, and, and I couldn't I couldn't pouring. find my bike. Oh. I've never seen harder rain. Oh, that's right. Yep. And we had cameras. Cameras. Oh. And, uh, we, were, we were riding electric bikes in a lightning storm carrying cam <laughs> carrying like... 30 grand each on equipment yeah, yeah. yeah. That was... this ought to go good that's that's scary man when you start trying to film in like hard snow or hard rain and you're it's like, terrifying oh. yeah. yeah i i got a question for you because i want to talk about some of your video content too because you're a creator as well um but the i want to talk about a question that'll seem like a little probably a little off-putting but i think it's important to ask is like one of the first comments we get from people is or questions is well how much did that cost how much did that run because it's like their favorite thing to talk about this isn't like a cheap toy you know what i mean it's no. a, it's an it's an investment what is your answer and what are the options available to people like if someone's listening and they're like well i'd like to get one but i can't afford that what's your answer to that and like what options are available for people to acquire these in the outdoor space in general when it comes to any outdoor gear you're kind of faced with that dilemma of do i just buy very entry level, uh, cheap product, cheap brand, or do I, as they say, buy once, cry once, right? Um, it, it depends on how much you're going to use it and how much you're going to rely on it. I, I personally wouldn't want to be 10 or 15 miles in and then have to walk back out because I rode an e-bike in that can't get it out, right? Um, and, and there's a lot that goes into the cost of a product. Um, I'll, I'll just, in full, full transparency, if you wanted to start an e-bike company tomorrow, you could, you, you could call <laughs> up China and say, Hey, uh, I want to order, I want to order an e-bike from your factory. And that's what a lot of companies do to be completely honest, even in the hunting e-bike space, there's a lot of people you'll see their bikes look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. That's because they all come from the same place and there's no innovation. Um, that's really one thing. the main thing that you're paying <laughs> wish. for with quiet cat is that like, it's U.S. design, U.S. engineering, right? We have a full team of engineers that custom design these quiet cats. Um, and so over the last 10 years, you've noticed we've always been the leader in innovation, whether it's DPO technology so that you can ch uh, change compliance and legally ride the bike at whatever trail system you show on, right? Whether it was us being the first people to put a battery inside the frame. So the battery is just not cheaply mounted on the outside of the bike where <laughs> if it, the battery gets impacted, it could cause a battery, a bike fire or battery fire, right? Whether it's us at being the first people to do a welded on rear rack so the bike can carry 325 pounds on the rack or our new stuff that we have coming that nobody else has ever done before, right? What you're paying for is that custom engineering, that custom design that's done here in the U.S. So you actually have a tool that's fundamentally built different and you can tell it in our frames. Those frames are custom designed in-house. They, they fundamentally look different. Now, a lot of the bike parts, right, the brakes, the gears, a lot of those are standard bike parts. So those will be shared between different companies. But when it comes to the brains of the e-bike, the actual like programming and the software, that's where a lot of the differences are made. And huge shout out to one of our engineers. His name is David. The man is, uh, he's a genius. Quite literally, he came to us from Garmin. Um, and so a lot of the things that you see in our bikes that are, uh, just fundamentally different and better have to do with how he does that programming, how the brain of the bike impacts the output, the power, the pulling ability. Uh, and so, yeah, you're, you're, you might look at a bike as an uh, un uneducated, I guess I could say, or like unknowing person yeah. around each bike. So you'd be like, Oh, that bike is the same as this bike. And they might look the same even, but if they look the same, doesn't mean they perform the same. A lot of the stuff is in, in the brains. It's in the software and the programming. What are the options you guys have for people to acquire them aside from just paying them like financing options, those sorts of things? Yeah, of course. Yeah. There's financing options through different retailers and through our website. Um, and you know, you don't have to get into the apex. You don't have to get into the creme de la creme. You can get in a, a pioneer or a ranger level bike, right? Which is going to run you around two grand, uh, new two grand, three grand new. Um, and then all the way up to our high end Ibexes and Apexes, which are in that five, six, even seven range. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I recommend is go out and find somebody who has one, right? The only thing as out West, as they say, the only thing better than owning a horse is having a friend who owns a horse. Yeah. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> you, you find a friend who's got one, go ride it, figure out what you like, what you want, 
Um, a lot of people can get by with that hub drive motor that only costs, you know, two, three grand for the bike. And then you get to start having all the fun, which is putting your accessories on it, right? And using those accessories to customize that bike for what you're looking to do with it. Absolutely. I, I, I That was just one of the things that I wanted to touch on because it's something you run into is people like, ah, if you look at the different financing options that you can find like at Bass Pro that you can find at, uh, um, you know, on your guys' website and stuff, they become pretty affordable and they're kind of worth it. I'm not going to do the cup of coffee thing. It's five hours a day. <laughs> oh, I know. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but just the cost of it. Well, and it's like, too, like, if you think about it, in this, like, someone like me, a motorcycle, you could buy a pretty decent, like, enduro or, for, like, two grand, or you could buy this thing that's virtually zero dollar upkeep, no fuel or anything, right. and you can tuck it away. You don't have to have a garage no, no or a shed rising. for it. You can just... It's so small. He can just yeah. put it away. And the le the legality thing, too, one of the things he touched on was in the hardware, you can actually change what the bike is capable of doing inside the screen. I'll dive into that a little bit. We're in the Ford Everglades, and we were hunting pythons. And where we were, you could only have a, I believe it's called, is it um, Series 2 or Type 2? I think Type 2 is the word. Um uh, type 2 bike, which means it only has X amount of capacity, meaning it's it's kind of a lower version. It's not as fast. The top speed ends up being like 20 as opposed to like 35. Um, and that's all they'll let you use in there. Well, if you buy an e-bike from another company, for the most part, you're going to pick up one. And again, it's Quiet Cat who innovated all this, but you're going to pick up one. And it's like, if it's not a Type 2, then you can't, you can't mm -hmm. use it there. And the problem is, you don't necessarily want to buy a Type 2 because sometimes you bet people $100 that you go 35. You want to prove you can go 35. <laughs> so you want you – You won't make the jump if you don't go 35. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want the huspa sometimes. Yeah. And uh, being able to switch back and forth legally is, is pretty darn cool. Mm -hmm. You know, you can lock that in yeah, place. We're, we're still the only ones that have that legal capability switch. Mm -hmm. I think – one other company is trying to copy us and they figured out how to decrease the power, but it's not legally decreasing the power because it has to say on the display class one, class two, or class three. And that does include, you you alluded to, pedal assist versus pedal assist and throttle and then speed. It's a mixture of playing with those things to stay legally compliant. The Greenway Outdoors is brought to you by Ram Trucks, built to serve. Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Your adventure starts here. Savage Arms, better comes standard. Nosler Ammunition, world's finest bullets, ammunition, and brass. Boss Shot Shells, superior made and American made. Carlson's Choke Tubes, the only choke tube we've ever purchased. Onyx Hunt, know where you stand. If you want to be here, it all starts here. At Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's, we have the widest selection of the quality brands you love to get you outdoors. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, our friendly, knowledgeable outfitters will help you find the right products for your next trip. Shop with confidence with our low price guarantee, plus club members save even more on great gear with exclusive member pricing. Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's, voted America's best outdoor retail. There's a ram. Legends aren't born. They're created. Introducing Impulse from Savage. The all-new American-made straight-pull bolt-action rifle. Unmatched innovation. Fast reloads. Maximized efficiency. Repeatable accuracy. Welcome to American Straight-Pull. Only from Savage. I have two things. One, riding them through town is really fun when you're going through like a 25 mile hour speed zone. Yeah. And you're like just blasting past You, you got to watch your speed because you're speeding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Not that we do that, you know. And number two <laughs> is a question. I don't know if you're allowed to answer it or 
how this works, but the the batteries come out of the quiet cats. They're obviously very powerful batteries. Has there been any discussion about kind of um, dual purposing those batteries for plugs and I other never things? bring a phone charger. It's on me. <laughs> I just. <laughs> I'd, I, we need to have you on our product development team because I've been <laughs> saying the same thing. And yes, it's something we're working towards. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that we even kind of took it the next step. Um, I can't uh, I can't give you too much more insight, but uh, with the 24 bikes, there's going to be all kinds of what I'll call uh, alternative power options oh, that's uh, awesome. when it comes to nice. not only the bikes, but the, the, <laughs> the batteries themselves. We get all the way out there for like a two day uh, camping trip. And, and all of a sudden, we all go to get on our bikes. There's four of us. And we should all have about 80% left. And Jeff gets on his, and it says 4%. We all and he goes, our Who do we all been charging our phones <laughs> again? Oh, man. Sorry, Jeff. We've all been charging our stuff off it. Uh, it. Yeah, the other thing, too, is like I just bought a, uh, a diesel heater. Like they make those little like briefcase diesel heaters, and we we're going to use it ice fishing. But the thing that sucks about it is. You ha- like it's got the glow plugs and the display and everything, so it needs uh, electricity powered through it, and which I think is stupid. But that's it is kind yeah, of. I dumb. didn't know that it needed that's, electricity. I think that's dumb. Yeah, the whole it's, bit you can't is... use it without it at all. Mm-mm. Okay, so that kind of sucks. It's so, a hundred bucks though. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be fair, so <laughs> I was just thinking about. I don't want to like drag like a big car battery out there. That's gonna suck. And then what are your other options? Well, a Jackery or whatever other mobile batteries there are and then i was thinking quiet cat's got a battery it'd be <laughs> pretty cool if i could find a way to hook that up to their battery so that's kind of like hey, the we, thought process behind my question there yeah no we live in the uh the technology age and the electronic age man and so if you can whether you have to charge camera batteries or you, you have to charge a phone that's your gps uh, the new iphones also act as a you know emergency satellite tool whether you're powering a light around camp, I mean, you can go down the list of reasons you would want to have access to power in the backcountry, and uh, yeah, we have that problem solved too. I'd like to note something that um, is another thing people try and poke at when I talk about uh, e-bikes, is because we're talking about the battery. Is people go, oh, you got to remember to charge it, and oh, before you go out each time, Easy. you got to charge it and stuff. Listen, listen to this. I my, mine sat for three months because we own some. We own a couple older Apexes that are like three or four years old. And then we also have uh, the Apex Pros that we've been using for this year for filming. Well, one of the Apexes that I hadn't ridden in, geez, probably three months or something like that. I went and I, because we were going to get a group together to go out, um, I go to turn it on and it's at 100% still. Held the charge for three months, not plugged in. Held the charge. Didn't lose anything, which is obnoxious. Because you would think, no way. Yeah. And the other thing is, the bike itself, like when you're running it down, it seems to know that something's up and it starts depleting a little bit how much it gives you to try and last out the battery as long as possible to the point where you'd almost think it'd be pretty hard to get stranded with it. Like it, it, it knows what it's it, doing. It's hard to run them down to zero. Like it you is. You gotta ride a lot. It, it wants, it, it'll go down to like 20. But it'll stay there, and then you turn it back on, it's like 34, and you're like, why? <laughs> we Die! Because we were supposed to run it down the first time you use it, and then we started getting upset because we couldn't. <laughs> we've we've done some dumb trips, and if anyone should have been stranded in the middle of somewhere where we're going, <laughs> what would have been us <laughs> on the things we've done with this bike, and they, they've held up. Yeah. That's I, another benefit, too, to having the pedals versus just a, you know, a, a standard like motorcycle-style electric vehicle where you know if you do run it out of battery, you've got the pedals. And then if you decide, like, because I am big in just, like, general fitness and, you know, yeah, I enjoy getting it as far as the backcountry as I can. If you're just going to use your throttle, you're only going to go so far. Mm-hmm. But if you are willing to pedal and help the bike, obviously, you're going to be able to go a lot further. So if you notice you're getting lower on battery, just start pedaling. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. It, it, it's pretty incredible how far it can go, though. It's a lot farther than people anticipate. It's a lot farther yeah. than people anticipate. You look at the battery, they do it in amp hours. So our, our bike, the bikes that you have are 17.25 amp hour batteries. A factor of 1.5 is if you're just throttling, that's how many miles you're going to go. A factor of three is how many miles you're going to go assisted with pedaling. And so 
I don't want to give away too much. I'll, I'll say this about our 24 bikes. We have effectively doubled the size of our battery in the distance. <laughs> that's, that's what I predicted. Current bikes that you have are. <laughs> well, because we, so, we, the hardware couldn't yeah. get, like the actual bike itself, like the frames and the qualities couldn't really get any better. That's what we were like, what the hell are they going to do? You know what I mean? Yeah, so you're at a 90 mile distance now. Uh, with the new batteries, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> and and then yeah, there's a, there's a, there's four there's four other things, and two of them are major fund fundamental mechanical differences. I can't I can't talk about it just yet, but you'll you know we're to gonna Ohio. roll those. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're gonna roll Scots. those bikes out here in like March. Or <laughs> I was just gonna ask when when are we gonna get to see them? Because that's yeah, pretty. March th- March thirteenth is the day we're going to unveil all this stuff, and then they'll be ready for pre-order in April. Oh, that's, that's so cool. Sick. I have a question. Speaking yeah. of miles, I'm closing in on almost six hundred miles on my odometer. I'm curious as to how high you've seen it on people you've been oh, yeah. kind of, or yours in general. Yeah, we have a guy at our company that uses it as a daily commuter, and he's up to two thousand. All right. Wow. That's nuts. What has he had to do anything to the bike as far as like upkeep? Like, like is he oiling the chain, obviously, or anything like that? No, and it's just still going. That's crazy. I mean, you t- you touched on it. Yeah, you touched on it earlier. That's like the benefit of an e bike, right? There's no oil changes. There's no gas. There's no. It's their their the electrical engine will never fail. Ours won't, right? They're they're too proven, and so really it, the wear parts are the tires. Um, after five years, roughly, you know, a new battery. Uh, besides that, you're right. Lube the chain. That's it. So he's gone that's 2,000 so awesome. miles. It's, he's gone through two batteries, and I'm sure he's lubed his chain quite a few times. That's amazing. <laughs> the only that. reason why I lube the chain is because I wash it. <laughs> and, it, it like, the one time I didn't lube the chain after washing – I not wash the chain. I wash the bike yeah. and, like, inadvertently wash the chain. Yeah, yeah. I'm not like trying to. I'm not an idiot. Uh, <laughs> He's out there scrubbing it with a toothbrush. <laughs> Man, this thing Soap. is filthy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that's the only thing I've had to do. Um, going through like a little mental exercise while you were talking, I was thinking about this. So in, in Michigan, we'll say in the Midwest for most people too, January, we're ice fishing. February, we're small game hunting. Talk about how amazing it would be for rabbit hunting. Because you're going to all these different areas and then walking these different plots and getting a different cover. And there's so many times where you're hunting field edges, farm field edges with like brush up in between. So if you could like go to the end, get somebody down there, do the walking thing with the blocker, similar to what you did with pheasant, just getting back to habitat on state land that other people won't be pushing. It'd be huge. March, you're pretty much doing the same thing. April, you get into turkey hunting. There's a ton you can use it for turkey hunting, mostly getting away from people. That's yeah. like the big hit for turkey hunting is like you're getting away. If you put birds to bed, you can get out of there quietly. So you're not starting up a truck and messing it up, putting them up the roost, you know. And that uh, for those of you who don't know what the heck I'm talking about, that's where you're like st- you're watching turkeys, getting ready for the season, trying to get their patterns down, figuring out because a lot of times they'll roost in the same tree. So if you can watch them go into the roost the night before – and you can have a pretty good calculation of where they're going to fly out to in the morning, then that's a great way to hunt. Getting out of there quietly is key. So that's huge for turkey hunting. Then you get into May and June, and you get into fishing. Well, again, the trout fishing thing, I deep dove into that, how important that was. July, you've got everybody working on setting up food plots and doing all these different things. You getting know, ice cream. Just getting getting ice cream, putt-putt, all of that sort of thing. So you need it for that. And then all of a sudden, August, you're using it because it's summer. Tell me you're not going to the beach with the thing. Tell me you're not going around the block with the thing. Tell me you're not – everything that you do in the summer, I mean, we're on the bike almost every day. At that point, it becomes our daily commuter. And then, boom, you're into September. Now you're in Upland. We already talked about Upland. October, now you're deer hunting. November, you're deer hunting. December, you're deer hunting. And um, you just used it all year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's something every month. You, you get a lot out of what you pay for. It, right. It's totally worth it. What What's the max towing capacity on, like, say, the Apex Pros? Ryan, I don't think you weigh that much, buddy. You'll be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> towing capacity is tough um, because, again, it has to do with friction. But, like, weight capacity, we say 325 on the bike itself, mm-hmm. right? But it's much higher than that. And that's one thing you need to look out for when you're, like, cross-comparing bikes is, 
com- companies have different approaches to like how they rate statistics. So if you look at like the the max distance, what we quote on our website, we'll tell you our bikes will go, you know, 40 miles, 40 miles on a charge. In reality, they go, you know, 50, 60, but we go on the shy side. Some companies will do the opposite. Um, and so you got to be careful with that. You know, take take all the stats with a grain of salt. You know, our, our company is publicly owned and publicly traded. So we have to be very honest with our figures from a legal perspective. Right. I was just thinking for the, like you're going through the list of things you can do with it. And aside from hunting and fishing, there's like ways I've used it was to like go get firewood a few times. And then I'm thinking about people who have ranches or whatever. I mean, it could be a pretty good tool for even on farms. Yeah. I've got a friend who checks cattle every day. He checks fence every day. He'll ride the fence with his e-bike with his, just like he used to do with his horse. And he's got his fence repair kit with him on his saddlebag. And he rides fence. He checks cattle during calving season in the spring. I've seen people use them for just about everything you could imagine. Um, it's it's kind of limitless and it's fun because everybody's different. And when you first get an e-bike, your eyes and your brain start to get kind of open to the possibilities. And it's it's cool. It's really cool to see what people have done with them. I mean, you have a lot of people will, they, some big benefits like training your dog, right? A lot of people don't get their dogs enough exercise. It's so fun and easy to hop on a bike and have your dog run next to you, Mm -hmm. right? Whether you're a hunter or not, like just a good way to exercise your dog. Enu would talk so much garbage. (laughs) He's riding in the basket. Yeah, (laughs) Enu's riding in the basket. (laughs) Yeah, you will, you'll wear them out, man. But yeah, again, like I use mine a ton with my kids, like, I used to get done with work when I had a pedal bike, right? I would be like, maybe one day a week, I'd, I'd take the kids out in the burly behind the bike and, and pedal them along. And I just felt, I felt bad because I enjoyed it. I know they enjoyed it, but I, sometimes I physically just didn't feel like doing it. Yeah. Now with an e-bike, five out of five days a week, I take my kids on a burly ride. That's awesome. And if I want to use my legs, I can. And if I'm not feeling it, I just punch the throttle and trust me, they don't know the difference or having just as much fun. <laughs> right. mm-hmm. so. hey, have you heard of any like, crazy fast top speeds where people like how they get going down a hill yeah like where people you're like how fast were you going you were going 60 (laughs) have you heard yeah you'll see like they they get fat obviously like our our top end e-bikes our our ibex will go about 40 on flat ground um which is wild your big speeds are going to be downhill and truthfully you're going to see more speed out of a road bike without electric assist than you will out of ours. Yeah, it's almost like something's going on in there. The friction. Yeah, it's like something's going on too. It like knows it. I don't know. It doesn't resist yeah, you, you, but it's like it's. I think it's the fat tires. Like you feel like I could be falling down this hill faster than I am. Like it feels like it's. I don't know how to describe what I'm trying to say, but yeah, with the electric in there, you kind of feel the resistance a little bit. Yeah, it's not. I guess it's a little bit. There might be a little bit of electric resistance. I don't think it's so much as that as it just is like the friction from the, the fatter tires. Because, I mean, they're 4.8 inch tires. That's pretty, that's pretty meaty. Yeah. <laughs> the Greenway Outdoors is brought to you by Ram Trucks. Built to serve. Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Your adventure starts here. Savage Arms. Nosler Ammunition. Boss Shot Shells. Wilderness Athlete. Fuel for the Rugged. Tracker Boats. Fish the Finest. Eagle Fishing. Designed for the Savvy Angler. Rufus Teague Barbecues, Snacks, and Spices. Rectech Grills. It's more than a grill. It's a way of life. Sea Dew. Make your own waves. LEM Products. Motivating people to hunt, process, and prepare their own food. Quiet Cat. The leader in electronic bikes for hunting, fishing, camping, and exploring. Consistency. That's what you aim for with every practice shot. So when you're out in the field, you get that same consistency every shot. With Carlson's choke tubes, consistency is what you'll get. Our choke tubes are long lasting, high quality, and made right here in the USA. Carlson's choke tubes, pattern tested, hunter approved. Find out more at choketube.com. Are you anxious to get going? Knowing that the clock is ticking and time truly is the most precious commodity in the world? Then you, my friend, are in good company. Aside from what you do at Quiet Cat, uh, which is actually how we got to meet, 
I had heard about you through Howl for Wildlife, um, which is a, a nonprofit organization that we're beginning to work with now. Um, tell me a little bit about what you do there and also kind of a little bit of an overview about it for our viewers because we're going to be working with them and actually having them on our podcast, but just kind of as a cold open introduction to it, I'd like you to talk about it just for a few minutes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I was recently extended a, a seat on the board of directors there, which I'm extremely thankful for. I've been working with Howell for the last couple of years, um, just doing some kind of like marketing, consulting and, and helping them any way I can because Howell is an organization that we as hunters and, and conservationists and sportsmen and women so badly need. Um, you see a lot of these very well put together organizations on the other side of the fence from us, right? That that want to stop our you know ability to harvest our own organic meat, right? PETA, for example, um, they're very well funded, extremely well funded, and extremely well put together. But we buy all that red paint. Yeah, <laughs> we on the they're a little bit more sophisticated than red paint now. Yeah, <laughs> we we don't have that on on the hunter side. Well, we didn't right until Howell came along, and and so that's what Howell is. It's an action center, and so you can go to Howell.org, and Howell will let you know when uh, certain issues come up in your area. They'll say, hey, you know, there's this issue, and the ultimate thing they do is they provide a tool so that you as a hunter can easily basically click a button. And it'll write up a, a note for you saying that you oppose this idea and it'll send it to that governor or that senator or that congressman or congresswoman. And so it allows the voice of the hunter to be heard. That's essentially what Howell is. It A, lets you know what's happening politically. So, and it informs you about it. So you can make your own decision on whether or not you want to oppose it. And then it gives you a tool to fight back against it. In my own state of Colorado here, right? We, we had the reintroduction of wolves that got passed that got passed by 0.5%. That is, I, it makes the hair on my body stand up because I grew up in Northern Wisconsin with wolves my whole life. I know what they do to wildlife populations and what they can do to humans, right? It's kind of terrifying. Um, and, and that got voted in by 0.5%. And the reality is, is if the hunters would have shown up on vote day, that wouldn't have happened and they didn't. And so Howell's goal is to make sure stuff like that does not happen. Right. And right now in Colorado, we have this ban of potentially the, a trophy hunting ban, right? The idea of banning hunting altogether for certain species like, you know, mountain lion and, and bobcat. Um, and how they structure that, right? How they position it on the other side is very frightening, right? They When they wrote that bill, they titled it a trophy hunting ban. And as a general person, you say, oh yeah, trophy hunting's bad, right? Well, the idea is it's not a trophy hunting ban. It's a ban to hunt, stop a certain type of hunting and that's cat hunting, right? And they even went as far as putting the lynx on that. The lynx is endangered and you can't hunt it anyways. So they do all these sneaky little things mm. to make this bill seem to the general public, we call them the non-hunting public, right? Um, they, they do all these little sneaky things to try to get people to vote on it. And then it ends up passing and next thing you know, we can't hunt. Yeah, and I, I think what's so cool about the program from it's like, as someone was like, well, how do they do that? Um, because when I look at a lot of nonprofit organizations in the industry, you see things becoming very corporate and things very slow to turn and slow to happen, right? So what I like about how is like if you were to get down to the finite details of it, they're like, well, how do they do that? If you became a member and you signed up, what's going to happen is when these initiatives take place, because he said like the hunters didn't show up, right? Well, the way that they would get them to show up is the people that sign up for Howell would receive an email and say, hey, this is what's going on. This is what they're trying to put in place. This is what we don't like about it. Here's a way to contact these people directly to have a letter sent to them so that you can tell them that you feel this way about it. And that's how real things happen. People say, well, why does a letter matter? Well, elected officials receive the letter. And all of a sudden now they're rece receiving thousands of them all saying something similar. I hate this. I hate what you're doing. They know they have to get votes in that area. Those letters make a big difference. And technically, you may not believe this, but elected officials are supposed to do what we tell them to do because <laughs> they work for us. I don't know if you have heard that or not. So um, that is kind of like the boots on the ground, how they're connecting the dots to get people involved. Howell does other things. But that's how they would connect. And if you become a member of it, then you get to become a fighting force of it. I'll add there too, to become a member is nothing. It's it, There's a free membership. 
So if there's one takeaway from this, everybody who listens to this, go to howl.org and be a free member. There, There is a, a, a paid membership too, uh, where you get access to discounts on different industry things and stuff like that. But at least go be a free member so you get notified. And, and then one more thing I'll add on to what you're saying, Kyle, is those elected officials, right? A lot of these issues, like the wolf issue in, in Colorado, for example, that was ballot box biology. And the fact that it got to the ballot is ridiculous. And if we would have been proactive and those letters would have went to the governor, it might have never hit the ballot in the first place. Right. It might not have ever been voted on. And that's the whole point, right? That's where it actually fundamentally, physically makes a difference. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting uh, organization and we're going to be doing more work with them in the future. And uh, I'm pretty proud of it. I, th I think it's awesome. Another thing, Kyle, too, it, I think that separates Howell a little bit because um, there's a lot of not-for-profits out there. Um, and they do great work. They do great habitat work, right? The RMS, yeah. the NWTS. There you go. NWTF. They, they, put, they put a lot. Yeah, and you can go down the list of all the different acronyms. They call them the acronym groups, but the DUs, uh, the TUs. Uh, they do great habitat work, but that's what they do. They do habitat work primarily. We don't have a legislative group in the hunting space to represent hunters. Now we do, right? And that's another benefit is because we're not, Howell is not doing habitat work. They are getting all of these acronym groups together. We're unifying them because the reality is we can't be separated or segregated. If hunters start getting after each other, if you don't trap, still support the trappers. If you don't cat hunt, still support the cat hunters because the reality is when someday, when what you love comes under attack, you're going to need everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. So support one another. That's the whole idea behind Howell. All the acronym groups, we need to have a unifying force, get them all together. Just because you only elk hunt doesn't mean you shouldn't support people who duck hunt, right? So it's combining all hunters. It's combining all the different acronym groups that do the habitat work and unifying one voice because that's really what we need. So like you were saying, they're trying to get rid of cat hunting um, in your state, in Colorado. Is it possible for someone like us in Michigan to advocate for you in Colorado or does it get disregarded because you're a non-resident? Yeah, it, it does. It lets you speak up for us. That's one of the great things about the Action Center within Howell is when you can write letters to our governor, right? Granted, they're, they might not take it for as much power as somebody from within the state, but it still makes a difference. Yeah, like you've got people coming in saying, hey, I come to Colorado every year and I hunt for this. You're trying to take that that's away. That's true. I wouldn't come then. Okay. You know? well, that's good to know. But, but... And one of, the, one of the things that the Action Center will do is if you outside of Colorado, it'll tailor your message to speak to exactly what you said. Nice. Your, your message to my governor will say, I, I've come to Colorado hunting for the last 10 years and I'm not coming this year if you pass this. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. That's really, yeah. And you can go in and tweak the letter and make it anything you want, add, subtract anything to it in order to customize it. A um, couple notes I want to make. Um, there are are organizations in the outdoor industry that technically were supposed to be doing legislative work, but a lot of them ended up being, and I'm not going to talk about anyone specifically, but they ended up being more of just like whistleblowers or, or screamers, or they would just call attention to the problem. And that was something that like growing up listening to Ted Nugent and us getting to meet and hang out with him and stuff, he's always like, you have to get involved. You have to write your governor. You have to do that. And the problem was, there was no organization that kind of finished the process properly, if that makes sense. Like no one was like actually converting you into do it. And at the end of the day, we all lead very busy lives. Hunting may be my favorite thing to do. Fishing might be yours. We may love these things, but we're also pretty busy, right? So like you might miss a law or you might miss something or you might not pay attention to this or pay attention to that. To have it be where you can sign up, have it streamlined and say, hey, this is the issue. If it's important to you. Here's a letter that we think would make sense for you to send. Tweak it however you like, and this is where it's going to go. You just do it, press send, and you're good to go. Realistically, you're like four clicks away from advocating hmm. um, and uh, and taking your time if you want to, but you don't have to. You could literally just send the one that comes. Um, that's going to make the diff. That's going to pull it apart where people are actually starting to advocate again. And the other thing about the group is I think it will inspire people to be like, once they're in the group and once they're seeing these things and they're like, shit, we are under attack, it's going to inspire other hunters to want to be a little bit more involved in general in elections. And, uh, you know, it's regardless of how you feel, I think, you know, hunters voting is a good thing to the point where it's going to help convert people into um, 
the right officials being elected. <laughs> I don't want to pick a side and say it out loud, but at the end of the day, we all know the side. So, um, yeah, and you hit the nail on the head. It's again, it's the unity, and uh, I think hunters by nature are apolitical, right? They don't want to get involved in politics. They they don't want like we're not one to like complain, right? But we need to change that mindset because the reality is, if you don't start getting involved in voting and being and like having your voice heard around what you want to happen, the other side is just going to run the narrative. They're going to run the story and they're going to determine what happens. And the next thing you know, the old slippery slope, you know, um, who knows, who knows where it's going to lead. I don't want to see that day. I, don't, I want my kids to grow up with the laws and the system that I grew up in because I loved it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And so I know that for my kids to grow up that way, is going to take me getting involved. Right? Yeah. It's a, it's a, the only place on earth left. You know what I mean? We lose this. It's it's we're like everywhere else then. Yeah. You know, only yeah. only rich people get to hunt and you don't need your guns. They did a, a full yep. ban on, it's on trapping in in California and 50 100 years ago that would sound wildly foreign to people like that would never happen, you know. And all it takes is one or two generations some some people are removed and now no one understands how it works, what it does. They, and know. that's the point, right? They, they want to chip away at it. They know that to take down hunting as a whole, they have to chip away at the little minorities first. First, they have to chip away at trapping because the hunters won't speak up for the trappers. Then they have to chip away at the cat hunters. Then they have to chip away at the rabbit hunters. Then they have to chip away. And then Aww. eventually, when, <laughs> when the trappers are gone to not speak for the hunters, and when the cat hunters are gone and the rabbit hunters are gone, now they can just remove hunting as a whole, right? It's just a matter of chipping away at it. Uh, another thing that is really cool about Howell is because they are strictly advocacy, like legally focused, there's no group that holds a chest of money to fight legal battles. And that's what it, uh, at the end of the day, it takes money, right? So like in Colorado for them to fight the, the ban on cat hunting, they're going to need to advertise to the public to vote against that and why, right? That takes money. Everything takes money. And there's no pot of money that goes towards that right now. There's pots of money that go towards habitat work all over the place, right? But there's no there's no pot of money that goes towards fighting that. And that's another thing that Howell is striving to do. All of those membership dollars, they go towards advocacy work and legislative fighting. That There is zero dollars. Everybody that works at Howell, the two guys who started it, myself and the other board member, take zero dollars in pay. Zero has ever been taken by anybody who works there. It all goes back back into fighting for what we believe in it's actually not just zero you guys are well in the negative <laughs> you guys are i talked to john yeah. i talked yeah, to john, john you guys yeah. are john yeah yeah john john is so he's so passionate about it so much of his own money has gone to fighting these issues that you're right it is so far in the red it'd be a terrible organization to invest in financially yeah uh, but but it is important we'll if, stick with quiet know, cat for that. <laughs> yeah yeah and I mean, we have between different companies trying to help Howell and different individual contributors trying to help Howell. Again, I think it's important to know that your money is not going into paying the people who run it. It's going towards actual boots on the ground work. A hundred percent, which is also pretty rare. You're, rare. You're, so it's rare. You like making content too, and I'm excited to see the ice fishing <laughs> video, but where can people find your other content and what can they expect to see? Uh, first of all, go to quiet cat stuff right all of all of quiet cats instagram and we're starting to build up the youtube video where we're going to do the the quiet cat shorts is what we're going to call them and that's what we did for the ice fishing film um so go check all that stuff out and that was a work project by the way so that wasn't for any of my personal stuff but um you're right kyle on a personal level i've always enjoyed uh i don't consider myself a content creator by the way so we'll start there it's very, uh, it's D level content, but a level hunts. That's what I like to say. Nice. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I've got almost 200, uh, hunting and fishing videos up on, on YouTube that I've been doing for the better part of a decade. It's all self-filmed. It's all public land, all DIY, uh, mostly solo stuff. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, holds outdoors is, is my uh, Instagram and YouTube. And do your kids um, it's, dig it's it? just like you guys uh you know they're a little little they're two under two so they're okay sometimes oh, wow. you know the daughter will be like oh daddy's on tv and you're yeah. like well kind of yeah <laughs> <laughs> not really that's cool that i it'll be interesting to see how they uh, how they dig it when they get older though like see like to have all those adventures in the library sometimes we talk about two is like the best part of the show and the vlog series now and all that stuff is like we have this rolodex of experiences that we had together because it's all just best friends traveling the world filming 
and then to be able to share that with our families and stuff later on it's kind of like one of the cool benefits of it i do think about that like one day when i have kids That's... and i'm old enough to show them what's the reaction going to be yeah or is it or like your grandkids you don't talk about it for you're just in a wheelchair <laughs> crippled and you're like i used to be on tv <laughs> <laughs> hey, the, the old deathbed strategy right you talk about like a lot of self-improvement or like how to make yourself a better person they always like one of the things is you know picture yourself in your deathbed looking back at your life and how like if you can feel good about that like you've done well right and <laughs> that's what is really cool about having some of this stuff digitized is i think about some of the lessons that my grandfather taught me and some of the stories he told me right and i never believed him it was one of those like uphill and into the wind both ways sure. stories, you know <laughs> sure and for some of my uphill into the wind both ways stories it's documented now so they're that's gonna awesome. have to believe me um that's a good point and yeah so i mean that's a cool part of it and and kyle you know sharing it with family is another big thing the whole reason i got into it i started self filming again a decade ago way before it was popular um and the whole reason i even started filming was i grew up hunting with my dad uh he was my you know best friend and hunting partner and then i moved out west and i didn't have him there and i i wanted to share these hunts with him and so i started filming these hunts I didn't even edit them and i um i was sending him a thumb drive in the mail with the hunts for him to watch and this is right as youtube was getting started and my friend was like, well, why don't you just put them on YouTube? And I was like, I don't want people to see where I'm hunting, right? It's all on public <laughs> land. So I just wanted to keep it a secret. And I didn't want to give any like tips or tricks away. Um, and then I eventually had like an epiphany moment where I wanted to share everything with people. But the point is I was, I started putting videos on YouTube as private. So my dad could watch them. And oh, I wouldn't have cool. to send him a thumb drive in the mail, right? And then eventually my friend's like, dude, why don't you just make them public? And I was like, ah, whatever. And I you know, flip the public switch and then it started to like grow and and then I got started getting really positive comments from people. Oh, I never thought about doing that. Thank you so much. For this helped. And now I'm, I'm shooting more ducks or, Hey, thank you so much for that tip. It made a big difference. And then it started the feel good started to come in and I'm yeah. like, okay, I'm going to start to help people as much as I can be more successful. hundred nice. percent. That's, That's awesome. awesome. That's super cool. That's like the most pure way to start making yeah, content. It is. <laughs> sure is. That's awesome. Well, thanks. it's not good content. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but a, a level hunts though. Yeah, it is. I've got some good ones. That's for sure. I've been been very fortunate, especially for, you know, the public land, um, the DIY stuff. I've been been very fortunate. I work really hard at it. Um, and I've always said hunt first, film second. So sometimes the quality of the content suffers a little bit, but the, the hunt never does. And that's what's important. To me. The, the, the fact that you've decided that's what's important and the fact that you understand one comes from before the other is like we struggle to film with people because it's not that way for us, right? Filming is yep. first, the hunt is second. And we always talk about it as like, it's tough, to, like filming with people that don't get it. But the fact that you get it is perfect because then you'll know when you go with us, it, it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> it, you guys, you know, you make your living that way. So of course it has to be that way. Sure. And your viewership and your, your fans are grateful because if you film the way I did, they wouldn't be your <laughs> so, it, every, everybody's grateful for it you know and what you guys do is extremely hard people don't realize how difficult it is to put a hunt together fishing's a little bit easier a little uh, just a little bit fishermen don't depending get saying depending that. right um but yeah and there's certain types of hunts that are easier to film too like i've got self-filming waterfall hunts dialed like i can have really a level uh, content around waterfall hunting self-filming now um, big game hunts, especially spot and stock hunts where you're not in a tree stand, that is hard to film, especially oh, yeah. solo, right? Where you don't have a cameraman, you're trying to film, you're trying to hunt. And you go through this huge learning curve of like, I spent my whole life learning how to hunt. Now I'm trying to spend the next decade learning how to film my hunts while I still hunt. And it's like this <laughs> whole, you guys know, it's it's hard. It takes yeah. a whole nother level of difficulty to hunting to try to capture it. And AJ and yell, Ryan are yelling at you. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Like I start open. <laughs> and, and all the animals are camera shy. Yeah, yeah they are. You should have been. You should have no, been here yesterday. No we here. Yep. yep. There's no hunt killer like a cameraman. I've always said yeah. that. Like you bring a key. Like you can have seven amazing days in a row, and then the eighth day the camera comes out. And it's just like dead. What? Yep. Hundred yeah. percent. Well, thank you for joining us. This was awesome. This was a great podcast. Yeah. I, it was good getting to spend more time with you, get to know you a little bit better. I'm excited to do a hunt with you. Um, and uh, okay. I, obviously, uh, we're pumped about Quiet Cat. I mean, thanks again. Uh, we'll link down Quiet Cat's website uh, below if you're watching this on YouTube. And uh, as always, 
Uh, go check out on HistoryChannel.com. Look at the history streaming stuff. Um, you can find it on the app. You can find it on the website. Just look up the Greenway Outdoors. You can watch our season there from History Channel. Uh, the weekly video uh, well, the vlog series is going to come out every single Friday. The video podcast still comes out every single Monday. So just watch for those. Thanks for tuning in and stay green.